Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lake City Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. We're glad to have you all here. Uh, this is our kids' Bible class right now. After this, we will have a teenage Bible class, and then immediately following after that, we will have our adult Bible class from TJ Gifford. So I'm glad that you all have uh, chosen to join us here, and uh, we're glad to have each and every one of you. Uh, we're going to start off with a song. It's one we've done a couple times before, but it really relates to our lesson. And as we've been learning about uh, heroes, in the Bible, and specifically in the Old Testament for right now, uh, we have been uh, talking about the ways in which God has helped all of these people who are heroes in Scripture to be able to do difficult things. And how is God able to do that? Well, we have a song I want to talk about that. So sing along wherever you are back at home. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the seas are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. And so we want to talk about because God was so mighty that He allowed some of these people who were uh, willing to do what he said uh, to become heroes that we read about in the Bible. So the last two weeks, we talked about Moses. And Moses was the person who took the children of Israel, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt and led them uh, out into freedom. Well, uh, we're, we're not going to go over what happened in the in-between time, but just real quick, some of you have already been learning about this on Sunday uh, morning Bible class, so you already know this, but uh, in between the time when Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt, uh, before they finally actually went to the Promised Land, it was about 40 years, because they went to the Promised Land, but then the people were too afraid to actually go into the Promised Land and do what God had told them to do. So because they weren't willing to go into the land and take it because the way that God had told them to, God told them they would have to go and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So Moses lives to the age of 120. He spends 40 years in Egypt, growing up in the palace and living there. He spends 40 years outside of Egypt uh, as, a, as a shepherd, and then he spends 40 years uh, with the children of Israel, bringing them uh, in into the promised land, bringing them up to the promised land, really would be the right way to say it. And now he's handed over responsibility to Joshua. And so that's who we're going to talk about as our Bible hero for this week and what he did when he led the people into the promised land. Because it wasn't just all ready for them. They had to actually go in there and do what God said and take the land. So we're going to talk about what happened when they first went into the land today. And I think a lot of you will know this story because we were talking about it a few weeks ago in our uh, Bible class on Sunday morning. So Joshua, this comes from chapters 1 through 6. The walls fall down. The Israelites came to the promised land. A man named Joshua was in command. The first thing they saw in the valley below was a pretty little town called Jericho. So the people of Israel finally did come into the promised land. And Joshua, if we remember, Joshua along with Caleb were the two spies that 40 years before went into the land of Canaan and they looked around, they saw it, and they said, yes, we can take this land. But the other 10 spies said, no, we can't. We're too afraid. We, we won't be able to do it. And so that's why uh, all the people listened to the ten spies instead of listening to Joshua and Caleb, who were doing the right thing. And so they had to go and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, now it's 40 years later, and Joshua is back. Joshua and Caleb is back, but we're only going to talk about Joshua today. But Joshua and Caleb are both back, and they're ready to go into the land. And the first place they've got to go is take the city of Jericho. God told Joshua, there's something you should know. It's all about the city called Jericho. The people there are wicked, so I'm giving you their town, but you won't get in until the walls come down. 
You see, back then, uh, they used to put walls around cities because uh, that's the only way they could have any kind of protection. You know, they didn't have vehicles that could drive fast or anything like that. They didn't have, uh, I mean, everything they would have had would have been uh, carried on some kind of a horseback or a donkey or something like that. That's the only way, that would be the fastest way you could go. Uh, today we have cars and trains and motorcycles and airplanes that can go into a city. Uh, but back then they didn't have anything that could fly either. So uh, they would build walls around their cities and then make sure that if there was any army or something that came to them, they could just close the gates at the front of the city and they would be pretty well protected. So they're saying that you're not going to be able, God's saying you're not going to be able to get in until the walls come down. The people living in Jericho at the time were very wicked. They did not follow after God and they didn't do the right thing. So how is God going to make the walls come down? Well, God told Joshua exactly what to do. He told him to tell all the people to. So early in the morning at the break of day, the people and Joshua started on their way. So they start going over there. And one thing that uh, this book doesn't talk about that we're, we're going to mention is that when God told the people to go to Jericho, it didn't all happen in one day. It actually happened over a whole week that they were told uh, to go once around the city on day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. They would go around it once. And then on the seventh day, they were to go around it seven times. And then, uh, well, we'll read about what happens in just a minute. But this is the time when God is actually going to give the land into the hand of the Israelites. Now, before they were too afraid. They didn't think that they'd be powerful enough to come in and take the land. But really, it wasn't about how powerful they were. It was about how strong God was because God was going to do all the hard work for them. So uh, they would just be responsible for actually listening to what God had said. First came the soldiers leading the way. This is when they're going around the city. Uh, first came the soldiers leading the way. Then came the priests with trumpets to play. Next came the ark of God with priests all around. And last came the rear guard. But no one made a sound. Now imagine you're in Jericho. Wouldn't that seem really weird to you? That you have this big army that comes around and they surround you and you think they're about to start a, a, a fight. You're about to have to uh, go into this big battle and you're going to stay on one side of the, of the wall and maybe shoot something down or throw something down at them and they're going to try to break the wall in. But they start walking around the city and they're just quiet. Wouldn't that seem really weird to you? I think it would, it would seem really weird to me at least. But that's what God told them to do. They had to go around. They weren't to make a sound. So that they weren't talking to each other. They weren't doing anything. They were walking around the city in complete silence there. All around the city, the priests and soldiers walked, but everyone was quiet. No one even talked. The trumpets gave a blast the seventh time around. Then the people all shouted, and the walls fell down. So... Joshua was one of the people who was brave, and he was willing to go and do what God had told him to do. But it wasn't because Joshua was so amazing or so special that he was able to lead the children of Israel to take down the city of Jericho. It's because God is so awesome and God is so powerful that he was able to help the he was able to take care of the problem of the wall and let everybody come into the city and be able to take it uh, from the wicked people in Jericho. It wasn't just because, uh, you know, these people were so amazing or anything like that. It's because our God is so amazing. And so remember, it wasn't just that uh, they went around uh, one, seven times, but they went around it uh, one time a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, that's when they went around it seven times and then played their trumpets. And that's when the walls came down. And actually, I've, I've heard from some archaeologists some people who go and they dig up uh, different sites and uh, a little bit different from like a paleontologist. They go and they dig up uh, dinosaur bones, but an archaeologist goes up and they dig up ancient cities and different uh, things like that. And they say that when it, you look at the walls of the city of Jericho, when they fell, they would have fallen outward. So if you were attacking a city and you were hitting up against the wall, it would fall inward. But because this was a miracle that God did, the walls actually fell outward. 
And there's more that I wish we could talk about because there's actually some interesting things about uh, Jericho, but uh, there's a lesson plan and there are some coloring sheets and uh, a matching game as well um, for y'all to look at. So I hope that y'all can uh, take a look at that as well. Um, so that brings me to our memory verse uh, for this week, which we've actually done for, but it's uh, Joshua 1.9 says, Do not be afraid, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9, Do not be afraid, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Well, I'm glad that you uh, chose to watch this video and be able to learn a little bit uh, or remember a little bit about the city of Jericho and about how awesome our God is and how strong he, he is. And just remember that he can help us uh, with what's going on in our lives and the difficulties that we face, the problems we have. We can always pray to God and ask for him to help us out because he really does care about us. I hope that all of you uh, learned a little bit today, and I hope that uh, we will see you all on Sunday morning. Have a great week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our teen class for our Wednesday night Bible class. I'm glad to have you all here this evening. Tonight, we are actually going to be wrapping up our study of Genesis, and so uh, we're going to be looking at the last three chapters of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapters 48 through 50. And as always, you know, we can't go uh, fully in depth in here, but uh, we would like to just cover a few different concepts and hopefully that can help you out with your own uh, personal study as well. So, uh, you know, the book of Genesis actually covers a very long period of time. It's one of the longest books of the Bible and uh, there's just so much information here. Uh, now, as we come to the close, really what we're going to be looking at is the death of Jacob and uh, specifically what he says to his children and to his grandchildren while he's on his deathbed. You know, um, the words uh, of, of a dying individual often carry a, a lot of meaning. Um, and even in our own culture, they would have, they have a, a lot of importance. And we place a, a great deal of importance on the last words that somebody says. Uh, in this ancient uh, time period, however, uh, that's even more so. It's viewed as the deepest desires of a dying person in order to give a blessing to somebody else. Um, you know, Isaac wants to bless Esau, and that's where we have the story where Jacob deceives him, uh, puts on the, the sheepskin, and makes him think that he is his son Esau, when in really, in fact, it's Jacob. Uh, uh, Isaac didn't actually die then. He would live all the way to see Jacob and Esau become, uh, be reconciled back together, and they would together bury him later, much later in life. But at the time, he thought he was dying. And so he calls Esau to him because he wants to give his, his firstborn son a blessing. He doesn't want to die without having given his son that blessing. Think about the words of Jesus. Jesus quotes from Psalm 31, verse 5, where he says, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those are the last words that he spoke before he died upon the cross. You know, we, we see these statements as significant because they, they are, you know, it's very important. And Jacob, when he's uh, at, on his deathbed, when he's at the last moments of his life, wants to use his experiences and to teach and bless his children and their children, their descendants, and pass along uh, the blessing, the promise of God for the entire nation of Israel. So I just want to talk about a, a few uh, short concepts that, um, uh, that we can gain from this text here. So first of all, let's talk about the power of memory. You know, memory really is a very powerful tool. It helps us to uh, remember to do things that are good and to avoid things that are bad. You know, I, I can think of uh, several different memories that I have where I uh, didn't obey my parents and uh, the, the law of natural consequences taught me a, a good lesson. You know, one involving a, a, a plug and an outlet. Uh, I, I learned my lesson, you know, one involving my, my head in a, a brick post. Uh, because I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing that I'd already been told not to do. Uh, well, you know, my, my parents uh, knew a little bit about what they were talking about and telling me not to do these things. Um, but I have the memory of those events that uh, teach me very well, don't do things like that again. That was not very smart. And I also have the memory of being uh, praised and, and being congratulated on doing things that were difficult but worthwhile, doing things that were um, important or, or the right thing, even when it might have been uh, difficult. 
Imagine being Joseph. You know, Joseph was sold into slavery, and you can only imagine that the memories that he had of his home helped him to be able to maintain uh, some, some sanity and be able to maintain strength while he is spending those long hours in an Egyptian prison. You know, one of my, uh, I'm not a big person on Facebook, but one of my favorite things about Facebook is it has this on this day function where you can look back over the years and you can see things and you can remember um, events and you can remember your perspective and when they happen, you can see photos of your family and see how people have changed. It's important to go back and think about these memories, but it's also important to go out and make new ones. You know, Joseph made new memories over the 20 plus years that he was in Egypt and he was rising to prominence and, and became second in control of the entire country. And likewise, his brothers, they made new memories back home uh, where they were and they, through these memories, grew and learned and became the kind of people that when they all came back together, so more than 20 years later, they were able to have a joyous reunion and come back together as a family. So that's the first one, the power of memory. And then second, you know, it, it's important to think about how we care for aging parents. You know, uh, memories seem to become uh, even more important as people near the end of their life. You know, I've heard plenty of people say things that they regretted, but uh, nobody regrets the fact that they, uh, Nobody regrets spending uh, more time with their family, you know, and, and perhaps uh, for many reasons, we take the people who are closest to us uh, the most for granted, you know. Uh, I know most uh, teenagers see their parents as very out of touch. In fact, sociologists tell us that most teenagers think their grandparents are more in touch with them than their parents are, you know. It's just one of those funny things like that. But our parents still deserve our time, our respect, and our, our obedience, you know, I'm sure all kids and teenagers hear the phrase, uh, honor your father and mother, right? But that doesn't really have an expiration date. Uh, it's still up to us as we grow and as we come, become adults that we respect and honor our parents every chance we can. You know, Joseph, uh, when he finds out that his father is very ill and on his deathbed, he immediately goes to him in chapter 48 and he brings his sons to Jacob. And Jacob looks at them in, in uh, chapter 48, verse 11. Uh, he says, I never expected to see your face. Remember, he believed that, that Joseph had been killed by wild beasts. So he says, I never uh, expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. You know, he, he would have remembered, Jacob would have remembered about Joseph, uh, him as a boy, him as a, a teenager and, and starting to grow into a man. And then he would have had the terrible memory of, of being told that he was taken away. But all that fades away when he looks at his son and he sees him all those years later. Joy was brought to this dying father by a faithful son. And then also the importance of these final words of, of the dying father, Jacob. You know, Jacob had a, a great deal of struggles in his life. Uh, he, he had a lot of difficulties. Um, many of it brought upon by himself, but he nonetheless had a lot of uh, hard times. But he finds the strength to address each of his sons in their last days. Um, and in so doing, passes on the promise of God to the entire nation of Israel and, and that has the tribes that we know of and we read later on throughout the Old Testament, throughout Scripture. And we can see the, uh, the fundamental nature of what he says here being carried out hundreds of years into the future. Uh, you know, we have the phrase passing the torch, right? And that comes from the Olympics, where you'll see the race leading up to the Olympics, where somebody will be carrying the Olympic torch and they'll carry it and they'll hand it to the next person. And that person hands it to the next person, runs to another point and hands it to the next person. until finally, uh, they light the gigantic Olympic torch that's in the middle of the host city. Well, in the same way, fathers want to uh, hand down different things to their children. And it's not just things, it's not just possessions, right? Um, but it's character and, and virtues and things, uh, memories that are important to them. You know, uh, Jacob passed the torch to Ephraim and Manasseh, who are Joseph's sons, his grandsons, Jacob's grandsons, because uh, of Joseph's faithfulness. And, and later history actually tells us about their distinguished number, that they grew substantially in size and also 
uh, that they were very faithful. You know, uh, we have been talking in our Sunday morning class through the book of Joshua. Well, Joshua uh, had, had his name changed by Moses, but he was from the tribe of Ephraim. And then later on, um, you're going to have Gideon, who's from the area of Manasseh. Uh, both of those people are distinguished. And then additionally, they, they grow in size uh, more quickly and substantially than some of the other tribes do as well. But at the same time, uh, Jacob looks at what is going on with his children and, and professes the truth. He, he doesn't, you know, mince words in some situations. You know, um, you have Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, all who at different times had acted inappropriately and had, had done things that were wrong um, uh, pretty significantly throughout their lives. And Jacob, you know, doesn't, uh, you know, curse them and their descendants forever, but he does recognize that. And because of that, a lot of the blessings actually end up falling on Judah. And we know that Judah was a, uh, a great kingdom that continued on for much longer than the rest of the northern kingdom of Israel, but the southern kingdom of Judah continued for much longer. Well, a lot of that comes back to that, uh, you know, their, uh, Judah had acted in a way in which his, his other sons did not. So, does that mean all, all the future generations are condemned because of uh, the actions of the father? No. We read in Ezekiel uh, 18 verse 20, it says, uh, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You know, parents can point us in the right direction, but ultimately we are responsible for our own decisions in life. Joseph's children were blessed because of righteousness. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi had their, their blessings greatly diminished because of the fact that they acted unrighteously. They had to live with the consequences of their actions. How are we going to live? You know, nobody is going to sit here and claim that Je that Jacob was a perfect father, right? He, he uh, shows favoritism to the extreme at a, at a clearly unhealthy level, and it causes all sorts of problems for his family. But the Bible still tells us that we should be respectful to our parents, that even if they make the wrong decisions, even if they do something that's wrong, it's still our responsibility to love and honor and respect our parents, even as they, they grow older and as we grow up. In most cases, parents do want what's best for us. But what really is a blessing to us is to know that our Heavenly Father, our God and Father in Heaven, he always wants what's best for us, even if we don't have that here on the earth. God wants what's best for us, and it's our responsibility to love him, to trust him, to respect him, and obey him, because through that, we certainly will be blessed. I hope you've enjoyed this study of Genesis. Next week, we're going to switch uh, topics a little bit, and I also can't wait to see each of you on Sunday. I hope you all make it for Bible class and then uh, worship immediately following. I hope you all have a great week. Hello everyone, this is T.J. Gifford coming to you once again from the Lake City Church of Christ. Thank you so very much for joining us for yet another Wednesday night Bible study. Sure hope that you're doing well and that your family's doing well, and certainly hope you will enjoy our study this evening. Maybe I can introduce the, the study that we have before us by talking very briefly about a childhood memory that I had. I may have been seven or eight years of age, when I went to the circus for the first time. And out of all the thrilling acts, I remember probably most of all the tightrope walker. And I remember at a certain point in the show, a man grabbed a long balancing pole and headed up a very narrow but very long ladder. And as he continued to climb and climb and climb, I, I recall him getting to the top of that podium. And as a young man, I wasn't sure what was happening. But when he put one foot out on this very thin, very narrow wire, I knew instantly what he was going to do. And in my mind as a young man, I thought, this is impossible. There's no way he's going to be able to walk across the length of this arena, way up near the top of this place, without falling. But sure enough, I watched and I observed. My heart was beating, and he put his right foot there on the, 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 the wire. And as he put his right foot on the wire and started to put some weight on that right foot, you can tell that balancing was already beginning to be a pretty big problem. 
And as he got his footing, I saw his left foot come off the podium and then stand and, you know, place it there directly in front of his right. And he was fully balancing on this tight wire way above the arena near the roof. Well, my heart was pounding. And I remember him taking very, very carefully a step and then another step and then another step. And, and then he would stop and, and re, regather his balance and then continue with this. Well, that stood out to me. And I've remembered that through the years, and oftentimes the lesson that comes to mind when I think of that is just how difficult our Christianity is to balance with our everyday busyness and lifestyle. I think it's a third world problem. I think it's not just an American problem, though, that many of us find ourselves very, very busy, even in a pandemic year. Even if the children are no longer living in the house, most of us who have jobs, especially those of us with small children, we find ourselves being very, very busy. And we have to wear so many hats, of course. In my life, you have your own unique look on this, but I, I have to study and prepare lessons, and, and I get to is the better way of looking at it. I need to be preparing sermons, and I need to be preparing Bible classes, and I need to be counseling, and I need to be visiting members and calling and reaching out to members. I need to be at the office some. I, I need to be learning and interacting with the church members. And when I go home, I need to clean. I need to mow the yard. I need to help cook. I need to help kids with homework. I, I, maybe if you, your kids do sports, you need to drive them to and from that. And that's just home and work. And then you start thinking about all of our church responsibilities and all of our other responsibilities. And so if you're anything like me, you have to wear so many different hats and it's hard to balance them all. And so I thought of this idea, thinking back at my childhood memory of going to the circus and that man on the tightrope, I thought about the concept of balancing our Christianity with the everyday busyness of life. Because you see, I think that is a challenge for so many of us, that we want to read our Bible, but we're, we're busy. And we want to be at every church service, but we find ourselves swamped, having, it seems, not enough time in the day. And we want to do extra things that make a difference. And, and I think most of us have good intentions and most of us have good hearts, but we struggle sometimes knowing how to balance our Christianity with everything else going on in our lives. And so this evening's lesson is centered around that idea. And I just want to offer you four reminders, all for all of us, myself included, four reminders that often help me to regain my focus in the midst of all of these distractions that often surround me. And reminder number one is when my life is unbalanced, when I can't ever seem to find the time to, 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 to do the things I know are most important to me, when I feel as though there's so much chaos surrounding me in my life and I'm losing sight of what really matters, I remind myself, number one, not to forget the reason I do what I do. Now, maybe we can rephrase this so it applies to everybody. We must remind ourselves relatively frequently why we have signed up to this thing called Christianity in the first place. Why am I a Christian? Why do I go to church? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I do the things that I do as a Christian? Well, sometimes we may forget why we became Christians in the first place. And certainly we could run down the list of a number of things, but one thing that comes to mind can be taken from Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, that, that, that I, I'm a Christian because I choose to fear God and keep his commandments. This is my whole purpose in life. That's, a, that's something to remind ourselves of. And certainly the Bible would tell us in John 14, 15 that, we, that if we truly love him, we will obey him. But certainly we, we, we obey him because we love him. But according to 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. And so when, I rem when I'm reminded, when I remind myself how much God loved me in giving his son, and Jesus loved me in giving his life, and so I, I'm led to want to love him in return. And by loving him, that means I must obey him. And in obeying him, I'm showing that I'm living up to the purpose for which I was created to fear God and keep his commandments. And so when the busyness of life seems to be distracting me and, and causing me to get off the path that I want to be on, I'm reminded that God serving him, demonstrating my love to him, is why I do the things that I do. 
You know, to take it a step further, we may be reminded of the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and following. But in the midst of that passage, he says, I have become all things to all men, that by all means that some may be saved. And the idea that Paul is conveying here is that I do the things I do. I travel, I preach, I suffer shipwreck and imprisonments and beatings, and I keep on that path because souls are too precious to give up. Souls are too precious to get distracted. And so in the busyness of my life, when I cannot find balance and I'm trying to walk the tightrope of life, may I be reminded what Paul said, that I'm doing the things I'm doing, that I may teach lost souls the gospel. Of course, winning souls was so important to Paul that he says that I became whatever I needed to become to win lost souls. And he also said that I did whatever I needed to do to win lost souls. And he understood not, that not all the people he came in contact with would be saved, but if all of his efforts led just some individuals to Christ, it was all worth it. And so reminder number one is don't forget why we signed up to be a Christian in the first place. Reminder number two is don't forget in the busyness of life to spend some time in devotion to God. We've talked about this at the Lake City Church of Christ rather recently, whether that's listening to an audio Bible to and from work, listening to, to these devotionals, these uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube videos going to or from work, as I know some of you do, or, or whether it's listening to podcasts or things of that nature, sermons, or just sitting down and reading a single chapter of God's Word and meditating on it throughout the day. We need to be reminded to take time to be devoted to God. And there's really two primary things we do to achieve this, and that is pray and study His Word. And certainly we can pray anywhere, at any time. We don't have to have our eyes closed or our head bowed or our hands folded. We can pray while driving down the interstate. We could be on Interstate 75 going north to Valdosta or south to Gainesville and we could be praying. And because of modern conveniences, we can even be listening to the Word of God while we do that. And yet the Word of God reminds us the importance of spending time not only in prayer but in scriptures. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, the Bible says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Why do I need to take time out of my busy life and study God's word? Jeremiah says, because I cannot find heavenly answers with inside myself alone. I must rely upon the precious word of God. And so prayer gets me closer to God in one sense, and studying the word does in another sense and also directs us in this path we call life, helps us to keep from getting distracted. First or Second Peter 1 and verse number 3, Peter said, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by seeking knowledge found in the scriptures of Jesus Christ, we can recalibrate, refocus, and have a balanced life once again where we are not overly distracted with the unimportant things that often surround us. In, in David said in, in Psalm 119.11 that your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God is what God gives us to help combat the temptations of the devil. And of course, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, that the, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable that it is useful for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It's also, it's also important to remember the words of Jesus in John 12 and verse 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. One day we will all stand and give an account for how closely our lives match this precious book called the Bible. And so when my life is unbalanced, when I'm overly focused on the things of this world, which the parable of the sower, Jesus, when explaining that, says that the cares and riches of this world have a way of distracting us to the point of snatching God's word out of our hearts so that we can uh, permanently be distracted and, and, and no longer be on the path of life. 
When we find ourselves unbalanced and, and distracted in this life, then we need to remember why we do what we do. We need to remember to be devoted to God in prayer and in Bible study. And number three, don't forget that your family is is your primary mission field. We talked just a few moments ago about seeking lost souls as, as Paul did. He became all things to all people that some might be saved. But if I, as a preacher, for instance, if I spend all of my time trying to convert the community and save the church and win the world to Christ, but the souls in my very home have been neglected, I am of all men a failure because my wife needs me. My children need me. If you are a grandparent, your grandchildren need you. Nieces and nephews and adopted sons and daughters, officially and unofficially. The people in our life need us, our closest friends and family members. And, and of course, this reminds me of what the Bible says in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. There the Bible says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. He says the fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. And of course, the analogy that David gives here is that a man who has a lot of children or has children is equivalent to a, man, a warrior who has arrows in his quiver and a warrior who, who has arrows, he is blessed. And when he compares children to arrows, this observation has been made long before I'm making it here this evening, but arrows generally go in the direction in which we point them. And mainly through our example and also through our teaching, our children will go in the direction that we are pointing them. And if we live our life overly focused on money and overly focused on the affairs of this life and our life gets out of balance and we're tipping to one side or the other, we have lost our focus, then don't be surprised if our children go in the direction that we have been pointing them for 18 years. And as a parent, this is a sobering reminder because I want my children to be even more faithful and have even greater faith and walk even closer with Jesus Christ than I currently am. And so I must do all I can to realize my home, my spouse, and my children, the grandchildren, close friends and family members, that is my primary mission field. May I do all I can to win them to Christ, to show them that the Christian way is the best way, that we may go to heaven one day when this life is over. Here's a fourth reminder when my life is out of balance, when I'm getting distracted, and the cares and riches of this world are snatching the Word of God out of my heart. A fourth and final reminder is don't forget that the church where you labor deserves your full effort and deserves your best. Now I say this whether I'm a preacher or not, because someone who's listening to this may not necessarily attend where I preach. But with that being said, I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus preached that we call the parable of the talents. And we often equate that to abilities, but the talents that are mentioned of there were figures of money. They were, uh, they were uh, valuables. They were material things. They were the money. And in that parable, a, a uh, master goes away and he leaves servants in charge of his vineyard and there he gives some this amount of money and some that amount of money and some a little less money. And when he comes back, he expected all three of them to make a profit all off of the money he left. And the first one makes a profit, the second one makes a profit, but that third one was afraid to, to, to lose money instead of gaining money. So he dug a hole, hid it in the sand, and set idle. Well, if we're Christians, we are not to set idle. If we're Christians, we realize what we have is not really ours. It's the Lord's. It's the masters of the vineyard called the church. And so, with all, with all of my with with my money, I must honor Him because it is the Lord's money at the end of the day. And with my time, I must honor the Master for it is His time that He has so graciously given me. 
and with my talents and abilities and that which I've been fortunate to learn and be trained in. All of that was so graciously given to me. It's really borrowed by the Lord, our master, and he expects us to use it. He would go on to say that every tree in my vineyard that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And so at the end of the day, may I remember that the Lord has given me time and energy and money and abilities, and I'm going to give an account one day how much of that time, energy, money, and abilities I have used to bring glory unto him. And you know that Matthew 5 and verse 16 says that we are the light of the world, City set on a hill cannot be hidden when you get to verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that the world may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so when I think of a tightrope, when I think of a man balancing with a balancing pole high above in, a, in an arena, I often think that balancing life is even more challenging than that. And sometimes we get off balance, sometimes to the left and sometimes to the right. We've got to worry about working and paying bills and doing chores and tending to things in this life. But don't forget to keep walking that straight and narrow path. Don't forget to stay balanced so that we're not distracted. And before you know it, we look up and Satan has, has caused us to wander so far away that we can't find our way back. And if you're listening to this right now and you have wandered far away in the darkness, don't forget that the Bible tells us we, like that prodigal son, can come to ourselves again. And we can honor God by getting up from the miserable pit we are in and going back to the Father and begging for His mercy. And when one person comes and repents, all of heaven rejoices. Will you be the reason that heaven rejoices today? If we at the Lake City Church of Christ can assist you in whatever way, either to become a child of God, to become a faithful child of God again, to help you as you're trying to grow and, and get stronger and closer, please reach out to us. We'd love to have you at one of our church services. We have Sunday morning Bible study at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m., and a evening worship on Sundays at 6 p.m. And we would like to invite you to come to any of those services. When that changes, when Wednesday Bible study is back in person, we'll let you know. But we just want to say that we love you and God loves you. And in this crazy life with all of its distractions, find balance. And that is best found in remembering what's most important. Hope you have a good day. And until next time, God bless.